Hi. Hi. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Good. 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 It's fantastic. Good to yeah. see you. Okay, so tonight we're having a uh, video, a DVD video presentation about uh, God and science and how science and, and, and is faith and, and science compatible. You know, a lot of people today don't think it's very compatible. <coughs> but uh, this is a video uh, made by Father Robert Spitzer. Father Robert Spitzer is a Jesuit priest, and uh, he was born in Honolulu. That's where Brenda's going. Look at that. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he went, uh, did all his schooling, uh, high school finished in uh, Honolulu. He's got degrees about the length of my arm, so I'm, I'm not going to go over them. He's, you know, he's got a Bachelor of Business Administration. Uh, he has a Master's degree in uh, Philosophy, in Divinity, Master's degree. He's got a Master's degree in Theology, and he's got a Doctorate in, philo in Philosophy. Um, he um, was the President, 25th President of uh, Gonzaga University. Um, he became a priest, he took his vows and was ordained priest in June of 1983. And this is what I don't understand, but he was ordained priest in 1983, and then he professed his vows to the society in 1994. So like there's an 11-year gap, I'm not too sure what happens there. With Jesuits, there's uh, more formation after you're ordained. Okay. Unless he became a diocesan priest and later joined the Jesuits. That's why he's so smart. Um, he's written numerous books uh, about uh, science and God, um, new proofs for the existence of God, contributions of contemporary physics and philosophy. He has uh, books entitled, for example, Finding True Happiness, which is a really, really good book and a good series, too, on videotape. The Soul's Upward Yearning, that's one of his latest books. And um, he's appeared on several national TV <coughs> programs, including the Larry King Show. Everybody familiar with that? Mm -hmm. Larry King Live? And he was on there with Stephen Hawking. Oh, wow. Uh, and Leonard uh, yeah, Mladenov and Deepak Chopra. So they had the four of them discussing, of course, atheism and the existence of God. So that was very good. If anybody wants to see it, it is on a, on a YouTube video. He was on the Today Show uh, discussing euthanasia uh, and PBS uh, talking about closer to the light, discussing God and creation. So, you know, he's, he's been everywhere. He's got a, a weekly, a nationwide, uh, nationwide television program on EWTN called uh, Father Spitzer's Universe. And it's every week, I think it's Wednesday nights. But you can get them all on YouTube, they're fantastic. And um, yeah, and, and his website is, is called the Magis, it's the Magis Center of Faith and Reason. And it's www Magis, M-A-G-I-S Center, S-E-N-T-E-R dot com. So, without further ado, we're gonna go right into the video. And then after the video, um, Deacon Jill is going to come up here and moderate and help us discuss uh, the topic today. It's a wonderful turn. Hi. Our talk this evening was a presentation by Father Robert Spitzer. And uh, hopefully at the bottom down on the screen, you'll find a link to the talk that we just watched. Um, so what I'd like to do now is open it up for any sharing or thoughts that you might have. Uh, just so all of you on YouTube land or in YouTube land know, our brains are quite in pain right now. Uh, we've never heard so many uh, 
polysyllabic words put together <laughs> in one long string of the theory of how God uh, began the universe or uh, the universe beginning and multiverses and I always thought multiverses was when you're quoting you know a whole chapter of the Bible you know, so <laughs> that's a multiverse to me anyway so but rather than asking me specific scientific uh, illogical questions which I don't know the answer to uh, I'll just stare at you and blink rapidly. <laughs> <laughs> but perhaps we can share uh, something of what we uh, got from what we could get from what we heard today, uh, what we found encouraging. I think the main, underneath the topic itself of what Father was talking about, about, about the, that the universe or the multiverse or, or existence as we know it, the way he was sharing, uh, has a beginning. It's also that the, the, the church uh, is not opposed to science. Now I will grant that in the course of history there have been challenges and struggles in us moving along in that direction. I, I do think that that's true, although not all of the things that people say the church did for that reason was that doesn't mean that to go from you know uh, thinking the world is flat to discovering the world is round was an easy you know uh, <coughs> chasm to jump but if I could speak on behalf of the church today now in this century in this era uh, the church is absolutely not opposed to science works with it and we know that truth is truth and that God is, is if, if God is the creator of everything, then everything that he creates leads back to him somehow. And that faith and science aren't opposed. Unlike uh, other uh, religious groups, a Christian or otherwise, who might be uh, strict literalists and see uh, faith and science as opposed, just like you'll have some groups that oppose technology or advances in medicine or anything like that, the church is not against that. You know, we can have transfusions, we can have surgery, we can, we, we can take advantage of the science. And to know, it's reassuring to me that there are very intelligent people who are members of the church who are also members of the scientific community. It's just they tend not to be promoted by our public information system known as the media. So, uh, but aware of that, it reassures me that you know we can hold our own in this conversation with with uh, other scientists and other people of other thoughts and views that we can hold our own in terms of bringing about this conversation about how did the universe begin, and we can speak polysyllabic. Not me personally, but we can uh, hold our own in terms of of that, aware of our own weaknesses and our own humanity, <coughs> but uh, certainly aware that the church is not opposed to uh, scientific discovery. Uh, and many uh, Catholics and many Christians are involved in every facet of science. Any other thoughts of what you might have got from the video? Anybody that's here, and speak nice and loud so that YouTube people will hear you. Yeah. As I mentioned immediately after the uh, during our break, um, for me, I think it's it's um, it's reassuring, but at the same time, I I choose to believe that all of the <coughs> discoveries in science and medicine, etc., everything about um, what we are discovering about the universe is God allowing man that intelligence uh, and it's amazing how it, ha it, is se it seems to be propelling at a faster rate than if we can think back at the time of um, the Industrial Revolution for instance, if I dare even put that as a, as a marker in time. Yeah. Um, that. Um, 
I think the biggest danger for all of mankind is to not think himself as God just because we have this ability to do all these mathematical equations to prove or disprove the theories that are out there, etc. And, and it, I mean, it's it's absolutely mind-boggling for me, and at the same time, it's, I'm in awe that there are people that are created that have these amazing gifts. But as long as we don't forget that it's that it points all back yeah. to God, our Creator. My high school physics teacher was a practicing Catholic. And he marveled at, uh, this was in a public school, he marveled at, uh, at creation. And for him, there, there has to be a God for all of that to, <coughs> for it to work and function and all that. He just marveled at it. And I think if, if we can approach science, it's certainly from that point of view of curiosity and the point of view of joy and the point of view of, of, of that. I think that, I, I think, Humanity as a whole is a lot like an individual, where, you know, when we're two, we know what a two-year-old knows. We can't know more than that, right? And then when we're 10, we know a little more. And when we're 16, we know everything. And then when we're 30, we know nothing again, you know. But as we grow, you know, we, well, some people more, as we grow, as we mature, our ability to know expands and grows and I think as as a as a people as a humanity um, you know from discovering the wheel to discovering fire you know uh, to to discovering the latest thing that's what we're doing we're growing right and we're, we're and also because there are more people now there are more scientists and there are more people studying, you know, more things. So that also helps with that expansion because there's so many more people looking at all of that. So I think that's cool that we do develop and grow and deepen that there are things that we have no idea about that people a hundred years from now will know that we don't know now, you know, that we'll, we'll learn. And it's always interesting. Anybody else? <coughs> Uh, just on the issue of time, when you read the Bible, Genesis, six days of creation, you give it a perspective. And then today's topic is 13.8 billion years from nothing to something. And in my mind, I always try to place, where is the six days of creation? Is it when it was nothing? Was it at the time 13.8 billion years ago? Or was it in just in the last few thousand years? You know what I mean? Like, well, we're I don't spectrum. think you can take, again, a literal thing. The whole thing is the story of God intentionally made us. I don't take any more out of that than that. I don't, I don't take, I, I think that the main thing is, is that in the mind of God, he says, I choose to be created. It's, it's often, uh, they often contrast the, 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 the story in the Bible, which is, they say, two stories kind of put together from different Jewish traditions and that, as opposed to one of the big pagan stories was that of the Gilgamesh epic, where we were just uh, the, the product of a conflict between the different deities and one had their guts split open and that just created the, the universe of the earth or whatever, right? And so it tells you that, that the divine beings just created us accidentally, as opposed to the story in Genesis, which is, is, is telling us God deliberately created us. God wanted us to be. God called forth this world, this universe, and us as individuals. That's the story right there. I think to try to over-interpret that uh, might step outside the intention of the story. Just like the same thing with the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is meant to tell us, you know what? You're going to go through trials and difficulties. Stay faithful to Jesus. But I don't worry about whether this, this event in that chapter of the book of Revelation relates exactly to uh, that politician or that world leader. I don't do that myself. Other people might want to, 
but I don't see that as necessary. I see it as basically saying Christians will be persecuted, will go through trials, we follow the Lord. I don't read more into it than that. The, per the, the, the thing is at the end of the book, the Lord wins. We will be persecuted. We've been, you know, we've had times of persecution, you know, up and down through the centuries, right? And so it's, how do I be faithful? So to read the Bible beyond what I think the authors would have meant those particular passages to mean, might, we might try to square around, like put a square peg in a round hole. We might be trying too hard to make something fit that it, it's not necessary. If we study the universe and see how matter was made and how light was made or how energy was made, it doesn't have to fit, to me anyway, a literal box like that. It's more fluid than that. But the theological idea underneath the creation story is, one, there's a God, okay, so believers say, okay, there's a God. Two, that God is a, a thinking being, a conscious being, and that God willed the universe, earth, and us to exist. That's a lot to chew on right there, to pray about that, you know. That's the main purpose. Uh, more than that, well, I'll leave that to the experts. If they can do that, fine. But otherwise, I think it's okay. Like someone said, well, how can there be light if there's no stars? It's like, well, again, if I try to make the, the, the story fit all of that, it's like, who did Adam and Eve's kids marry? Who did they have kids with? If I overthink then I start thinking about incest and all that kind of weird stuff, and I make the story say more than it, it's, it's able to say, because it doesn't tell me everything. It just tells me God created humanity. Go you know, from there. Right? I don't want to overread or underread. Anyway, yeah. that's at least what I know, anyway. Sorry, I can't say it in big polysyllabic words. <laughs> Anybody else? There is a, a resistance in some Christian circles to accept the theory of evolution, uh, of how we change over time, how it, you know, animals evolve and people evolve and all that sort of stuff. Um, and that has caused a lot of you know, friction in some circles um, where the uh, non-denominational churches don't want to send their kids to public school because they'll be taught evolution, uh, and they don't see that as compatible with creation. Right. Yeah. And so, um, how can we mm, help that along? Do you think? I think part of it—it's a complicated thing because I think sometimes the the the, uh, the theory of evolution is is uh, presented in a purely atheistic, anti-religious bias, too. Mm -hmm. and, and so that can make people of faith upset, even those willing to accommodate evolution. So it's, and then you have like, like militant atheists and militant fundamentalists on both sides, you know, uh, picketing each other and say, well, okay, that doesn't open itself to a kind of a dialogue here, and how do we do that? In a public school, they should respect the faith of all of their students, whether they're Muslim or Catholic or Baptist or whatever, that's fine. But you say, okay, your various traditions will tell you the theology behind what we're teaching you. We, we're not competent to tell you that, but we can tell you that there is a developmental process that happens in, in, uh, in biology, right? Now, again, there may be, again, not being a scientist either way, a lot of people who are creationists will say, well, there are gaps in evolution that don't prove everything. And so that doesn't mean you have to be a pure creationist, but you have to say, well, how it all unfolded is a bit of a mystery, but for the believer and for the Catholic today can accept evolution, believing that God's hand has to be in it. And as far as our tradition teaches, there must be a beginning of humanity, and that at the beginning of that humanity, that humanity was endowed with a living soul. 
with a rational soul. And so from that point on, there's a beginning of, of humanity. Aside from that, how the development happened and, and stuff like that, you see some developments with different, um, different creatures, where you see, oh, well that, that, they kind of adapted a little bit or, or whatever. Uh, I'm not an expert on either side, but I think a Catholic can kind of walk and chew gum at the same time in this thing, you know, <laughs> where, where we have a both end. We have a development and we have a creation, right, because God made it. But again, I, I take the human being, or, or any animal, right, begins as a little, little, little thing, right? Begins as a little, little, little thing, and it grows, right? And, and that's creation. Right? It might have began with a few cells, and then it, it grows into many different variety of beings, right? And it's, if, if I was developed, I wouldn't pop out of my mom as a full adult. You know, I started little, and I grew from there, right? And so that development, so the universe, again, the same thing, or, or, or living beings could have, you know, started out that way, but hopefully, there is a providential guidance, just as there's a providence in my own life, as far as where I am in life and what I'm doing in life, and there's providence there, that there's a hand of God that works through the creation of grass and trees and flowers and bumblebees and everything else, right? That God's hand is working and all that, because you look at all the variety of creatures and you go, well, that's just amazing, you know? And you think, there's a creativity there, and, and it's hard to see it as random, for me anyway. Mm. There's a group in the random. States that created a theory that ran the center point. It's called the theory of intelligent design. So it's between evolution and creationism. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's yeah. the intelligent. Intelligi so you have design. intelligence, okay. So a, a Christian or a Jew or a Muslim is a God, right? He's intelligent. And he goes, I make a dat, right? I, when, I, when I go to Rome and I see the Pieta, right? Well. The stone didn't make itself. Somehow it's carved, right? I said, there's a mind behind that. So there's a mind that, you know, but the mind didn't make the mark. You know, it's like Michelangelo had to take that marble and create it out of, out of something, right? And so it's like this marble didn't just make itself, right? It, it had to be made into that shape, right? And so you see an intelligence behind the beauty. If you look at the beauty of creation and you say, well, who painted this picture that we see in three dimensions? A really great Leonardo da Vinci. We call him God, right? Yeah. Yeah. Just to go back a little <clears throat> ways that you were talking about, uh, you know, the seven days, uh, what were you talking about? Creation versus evolution? Yeah, the evolution, yeah. Uh, Spitzer actually has a, uh, <laughs> Spitzer has a uh, video on that. <clears throat> it's called, um, uh, the, the Remarkable Evidence of a Transcendent Soul. And the origins of man, like they can date back the origin of man to, we have a common um, mother and father. Uh, they can date back the, the genes anyway to one mother and one father. So everybody has this common ancestor. About 300,000 years ago. But then about 70,000 years ago, something happened that uh, the human being just exploded in their language and in their thought and everything like that. And they claim that that's when God would have infused the soul into the human being, about 70,000 years. So if you want to know more about that, go to magiccenter.com <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so there's interesting <laughs> science there. Yeah. At least uh, one possible way of explaining yeah, it. Yeah, because right? you know, we think in terms of, okay, well there was Adam and Eve, and then, oh, they had kids, and then the kids kind of, you know, had kids, and then, well, that's it. But according to the latest evidence, you know, this is the latest theory, is that at one point, it was just that God would have infused a soul. Things started changing, and then he compares at that point. And then they, they compare, you know, like they have chimps today. 
You know, they do experiments with, with chimpanzees, and they can identify about 180 symbols. Uh, you know, like a banana, you know, a tree, and they can identify these symbols. But if you, uh, if you say, you know, uh, the dog bit the man, or the man bit the dog, they can't differentiate between that. But a three-year-old can. And so why is it that a three-year-old, you know, what happened in the evolution to, to change that, uh, that perception? Interesting. Because anyway, we'll watch it and hopefully that will give you some more ideas about that. Should we end with prayer? Yeah, I think we're good. Okay. Any other questions? No. Would we want to thank you for this wonderful universe that you have made? We thank you, Lord, for making us so that we may uh, marvel at this creation of yours and, and uh, enter into a relationship with you. Pray that you uh, help us to retain what we possibly can retain from this presentation, at least knowing that, uh, that we can trust that you are there with us and that uh, you want us to exist, you call us to exist, and we are there to serve you, to love you, to know you. Help us, Lord, to uh, go from this place assured of your love for us and of the grace that you give us to live our lives. We pray your blessing upon each of us in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.